introductory slide, which I think is most of the public engagement with public service to, uh, delivery at the moment. Uh, the media um, focus on service delivery protests. Um, and what's interesting here is if you look at the red line um, from 2004 to 2012, uh, the red line shows the proportion of individuals who say in a Mokinor survey that they think the government is not performing well. So that has been rising very, very <coughs> steadily. And then, of course, what we see is the number of service delivery protests uh, tracking that. And this number is based on, on um, municipal IQ press release, um, only going up to 2012. But I think this graph, I would have had to create an entirely new scale if I wanted to include 2014 and 2015 on this. <laughs> What is interesting to me is if you scan the press and if you um, talk to individuals who are uh, ward councillors connected to these processes, the complaints are often about houses, water and electricity, which are not the things that will in the end ruin your life. It ruins your life now, but what you should be protesting about is education and health. So in that way, I think it's, that gives me some rationale to distance myself from the service delivery practice and say, but is the perception necessarily what has happened? Um, what we've seen since the end of apartheid, we've seen expansion and equalization of public spending, that's undoubted. Um, we've seen a dramatic increase in access. So money is going to the right places in principle, and as far as we can create resources um, and, and do simple things like connect people to water and to electricity, thumbs up. Um, also, what we've done is we've tried to remove financial constraints. Um, we have a lot of free basic programs that we've initiated. Also, um, the free uh, no-fee schools, as Mohammed said, and then um, the abolishment of um, primary health care fees uh, shortly after 1994. But, and this is the big but, <laughs> Um, 20 years after apartheid, while we know that we have increased access to public clinics, we still have health outcomes which are dismal and unequal. We have shrunk the gap in educational attainment. There's less of a gap between, for instance, the average white and black South Africans' uh, year of education that they achieved. But in the end, the gap in terms of edu educational quality, remains as stark as ever. This starts to give you some picture of, um, of both the low performance, but also the variability in performance. So by grade four, children should be, able to, should be transitioning from learning to read to reading to learn. But what we find here is that um, the red measures in polls, um, which is an international survey, the number of learners from each language group that achieved the lowest international benchmark. 30% of our learners could not do this. A much lower proportion amongst English and Afrikaans speakers, which speaks to the inequality, the remaining inequality in our system. Um, and then very troubling amongst certain language groups like the Savenda and Sepedi, uh, more than half of the learners could not do this. And the sad news, and we've, we have research to show that, is these learners do not catch up. These gaps do not shrink. Um, and there's no, now a lot of dialogue, exciting dialogue in the education sector about teaching skills rather than teaching curriculum. Moving on to, to health. Uh, <laughs> Looking at 2010 data uh, from the World Health Organization, what we compare the maternal mortality rate per 100,000 live births to our um, per capita health expenditure. We compare ourselves to peers, which is 15 uh, countries below and above our GDP per capita. And what we find looking at the peer means, the uh, peer medians, 
um, is that while we have almost exactly the same public per capita expenditure on health, uh, we have a maternal mortality ratio which is about five times that of our peer countries. Our maternal mortality death rate, we in really poor company, we amongst the top 40 worst performers in the world, but I think it's important to acknowledge that recent reports by, for instance, Patterson, who, uh, where they have audited maternal deaths, found firstly that there's been a dramatic increase uh, comparing the last period, 2011 to 2013, to the previous three periods. Been a dramatic increase in the uh, maternal deaths that could be attributed, well, we lack of training and lack of skill was a significant factor. Just to show that it's not just confined to maternal deaths, there's also been similar targeted hospital audits by um, Allison and Patterson um, looking at neonatal deaths, and there we find the same patterns, a lot of avoidable deaths due to lack of antenatal steroids, which is a pharmaceutical stock management issue, insufficient nursing staff, and fetal distress not being monitored. While seven out of a thousand live births um, result in death, for the white population, the ratio is 67 uh, for the black population. In terms of what this means, where one goes with this, how does one improve service delivery? There's limited scope for, for increased spending. Stan has demonstrated that very convincingly. It's clear that implementation and operational issues around efficiency and effectiveness become the center of the agenda. The policy making is good and the ideas in the legislation are good. Where we fall down is with implementation. And sadly, uh, decentralization has not helped because decentralization has increased the burden on managerial capacity. Also, specifically in schools, there's been a lot of research to show that um, there are also issues with the skills of our teachers. A big part of the solution space at the moment is around systems, trying to put systems in place that can, in small ways, um, compensate for lack of managerial capacity. Monitoring and unevaluation links into accountability. At the moment, often, we don't have the information uh, on local level available to know how our schools are doing. Our, our parents don't know that their kids are not in good schools. Parents don't know what to expect because they themselves, sometimes a lot of the poor parents did not go to good schools themselves. So there's a lot of space for public engagement. There's a lot of space for us to be part of the solution. Um, and um, in a lot of the NGO work that I do, we find a very worrying amount of disengagement and passive waiting, um, which makes it very difficult for civil society to operate. That already merges into my second point about the role for civil society and non-profit providers, but also for-profit providers. Private sector and, and also the non-profit provider, uh, provider space can be a very interesting laboratory, even if it's small at the moment, it can be a very interesting laboratory to look at different ways of doing things, um, different ways of recruiting, different ways of um, rewarding performance, uh, but also entirely different approaches. Of course, within the confines of the policies that we have at the moment, uh, but given that we really stuck with implementation, I think there's a lot of exciting possibilities around this, and I think that is where I place a lot of my energy is trying to think about ways in which one can grow that space and um, create sort of a more dynamic dialogue that is engaged with the public sector. There is definitely indications that things are improving. It's not at the moment very robust. Uh, but as I said, maternal mortality rate has gone down. There are a lot of um, positive, I think, uh, moves towards improving um, implementation, taking implementation seriously, taking monitoring and evaluation seriously. So I think um, there is a lot of reason for optimism, but I think there's also clearly also an agenda for action <laughs> because the, the deficit, the social debt is huge and it's important for everybody to get involved. Thanks. Thank you.